And I follow, I follow people's careers. My wife follows them on Instagram. Mm -hmm. And you hear constantly about these writers that get burnt out. I yes. mean, everyone from Ryan Villapoto to Ryan Dungey to yep. Ricky Carmichael yep. and even, even other guys. What's up, everybody? It's Dave Drakes with The Collective Experience, and we are back for another TC interview. Uh, I'm pretty pumped on this one. Uh, as you guys can tell, we've got the one, the only, Mr. Kyle Brotherson from uh, DirtBikeChannel.com. What's going on, Kyle? How are you? Oh, I'm so good. Thanks for having me on. I'm excited to, to come on. I'm kind of a, a big fan of what you have going on, so thanks for bringing me on. No, no worries, man. Big fans uh, over here as well. Um, always tuning into your channel, uh, always watching the cool stuff. Um, you know, you and I talk a little bit off air too. And um, yeah, I've still, you know, being in it so super long racing since I was however old, still learn stuff from your channel. And I think it's freaking awesome. All the cool stuff that you guys are doing. Um, I think a lot of people who are going to be watching this are going to be fans of yours as well. And uh, it's, it's, uh, it's super cool to see all the cool bikes, the cool builds, the cool projects and pretty much you've got the coolest job in the world as far as i'm concerned <laughs> well thank you i feel i feel kind of jealous between you and several people that i've met in the industry that got mm. in to dirt bikes at a really young age i'm trying to do that with my kids but i didn't have a motorcycle or a real dirt bike until i was about 30 wow. and so i just turned 40 now so mm -hmm. i've got about 10 years in and i feel like people like you and various other people are just like these kind of giants in the sport and in, in a lot of ways, you've got a lot more experience to offer. And so I've had to try to, I've had to try to play catch up, you know, and I've come at it at a different angle than a lot of people do, uh, because I was like, okay, I'm 30, <laughs> I'm 30 and I have a technology sales job at the time. Yeah. And I'm like, I'm not going to win races or anything. So I came at it with a different experience and I don't know, I guess, I guess I offer a unique, uh, angle or a unique aspect to this that maybe maybe in some ways is relatable to a lot of like weekend warrior type people. And I think yeah. that's been my main demographic is this huge part of the, you know, swath of our community that are weekend guys, you know, maybe, yeah. maybe there are some, you know, casual racers or things that kind of watch what I'm doing, but there's so many people in this sport that are just, you know, a weekend desert rider, or maybe I, maybe somebody that races desert once or twice a year, or just mm -hmm. somebody who goes and trail rides. Yeah. And I've tried to put out content over the years that, you know, can, be consumed by a, a wide, a wide variety of, of writers and listeners and watchers yeah. inside of a small demographic inside, inside of dirt bikes. So it's been fun. No, for sure. And one thing I find really interesting is that even though, uh, you know, you say you've only been to 10 years and stuff like that, you've got so much knowledge amassed in that. And I'll say, I think that's short amount of time for as much as you put out. It seems like, you know, you would be in it for 50, 60 years and not just 10. How do you, how do you get all the information and like disseminate that out? Like, how do you get all of this uh, knowledge that you put out in the channel? Cause like, like I said before, man, it seems like you've been at it for so long and, and people get so much out of it. Yeah, well, <clears throat> for me, really, dirt bikes just took over my life. Uh, you know, I started in this uh, just I, I was really interested in cameras. Um, I've been interested in a lot of different things. I played guitar. I had like a, a kind of a family band. We played yeah. in a rock band. and Which is super rad, by the way. <laughs> yeah, there's, awesome. there's, yeah, there's a few videos online, but mo some a lot of them are unlisted on my channel. But mm. You know, over time, I was just started to kind of combine two things that I really was interested in. Number one was cameras. Mm -hmm. People don't really realize that. And yeah. then the second thing was dirt bikes. And it just slowly started happening. And I mean, if you start to document things, it, it's amazing. I'm sure that you've forgotten things about dirt bikes that I've never known. I'm sure mm -hmm. of that. And if you like imagine, Dave, if 10 years ago, mm -hmm. you know, you would have been doing something to your bike. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe you know changing some seal or something if you would have put out a video on that mm -hmm. if you would have put out like an eight minute video on that and every time you had to do something to a motorcycle you took the extra time a lot of extra time yeah. to document it mm -hmm. and put that online the 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 amount of content that dave drakes would have would dwarf what i've got i mean especially if you did this for your entire riding career because mm -hmm. i know that you've been riding since what like seven or eight something yeah, like that yes yeah, super early yeah so if you had done that 
And you had kind of made this little extra effort to comment on, hey, okay, so today I'm changing fork seals, or today I'm showing you how to set sag, or today I'm showing you how to install this tire, or today I'm talking to you about this new tire that I'm trying, or today I'm going to show you how to change oil. Mm -hmm. If you had done that, like your content library would be much, much larger than mine. And so I, I feel like in a way, yeah, you look at maybe my channel and you say, oh, Kyle's got maybe 900 videos or something. And you're going, mm -hmm. Look at all. But in reality, so many of the people in our industry know so much. And I still feel like yeah. a complete newbie when I talk to a lot of different people that have been riding for 20 or 30 years. I'm just like, mm. these people know so much more than I do. But then on the flip side, there's also a lot of people that are coming into our sport, as yes. you know, Dave. Yes. Yep. And these are the types of people that I think I'm able to influence more than some of these vets, yeah. you know? I think it's really cool that, that somebody like you can say, Hey, I can watch your channel. I can still learn things. And that's great. But what I really, what probably my, my bigger demographic is and where I can make more of a difference are the people who have been in the sport a little bit less time than me, yes. or sometimes a lot less time than me. Maybe, yes. maybe you're just getting in this year, or maybe you just got in last year and you weren't really that serious about it. And now you want to start doing your own maintenance or you want to start changing your own tires. Mm -hmm. um, and those are the types of people that I, I really think about a lot when I'm making videos, yes, you know, because I don't have the deepest experience. Like I can't tell you how to, you know, rebuild every aspect of your four stroke in your garage. I'm like, I pro I'm not that guy. Mm -hmm. Can I help you understand how to change a top end on a two stroke? Yeah. Can I help you to understand, you know, maybe installing a different head or changing tires or things like this? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And so there's a lot, there's a really, there's a lot of stuff that we can talk about in dirt bikes. Um, that can really help these new people that are coming into the sport. And ultimately as the sport grows, I think that's, that's a good thing for us. And, and that's been where a lot of my effort has, you know, has been. Oh, for sure. And, and I think about like when I first started, I mean, my dad was a cyclist. He had no idea. He rode motorcycles, but had no idea about dirt bikes. Right. So, I mean, if we had something like, you know, dirtbikechannel.com and click on YouTube, if YouTube was a thing back then, and, uh, you know, we, we could, we could watch like, Hey, here's how to size up the right, the right, um, you know, back tire or the right boots for you without having to go through all the growing pains. I mean, I can't tell you how many pairs of boots my parents bought me that were like top flight Alpine stars of the day that I did not need as a mini rider. Cause I was going to outgrow them in four months anyway. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like stuff like, and I think that's what's been that your channel does really well is breaking all of this stuff down into easy language layman's terms to the point where it's digestible for a lot of people. Like I said, even my, myself all the way down to the new person. Um, and I, I think it's so much needed in the sport. Um, you know, you and I talked a little bit before about how, you know, we're seeing just a huge boom in the industry and how we're going to start needing more and more like reference material for these new riders so that they can go out there and get things done right safely and for the right price. Cause if we don't, our industry is going to implode. Yeah. Yeah. It's true. And, and another thing that I, I, and I get this question all the time. People mm -hmm. ask me, in fact, it's probably the biggest question that I get is, mm -hmm. you know, what, what dirt bike should I buy? For yeah. whatever reason, a lot of people come to me with that question mm -hmm. and it's happened so many times. I mean, it's happened thousands of times. So I just have kind of like a copy paste reply. Uh, and now I have an assistant that's helping me add some additional color to those emails and things. Um, <clears throat> but it's, it's, so it's important for people to know as they're coming into the sport, it's not only what bike you should buy, but it's all this other gear that you should buy, Yeah, you know? And I think it's probably the biggest problem. The biggest problem with our sport growing is the barrier to entry, because as you know, Dave, like the bikes are expensive and yes. even the used bikes are expensive. Yes. And especially now after COVID, like everything has gotten super, you know, super pricey, but if you're, let's say you're 17 years old and you really want to get, get into bikes, or maybe you're 21, you just got a new, you know, you got a decent job. It's the best money you've been making mm -hmm. and you, and you saved up $4,000 and people will come to me and say, Hey, I got $4,000. What bike should I buy? And I, I kind of have to bring them back down to earth. And I say, well, really you have $3,000 to buy the bike because you need about a thousand dollars worth of gear. You know, yes. now, obviously we can, we can cut that. We can shave that down a little bit but I don't think you can really realistically protect yourself for less than 500 bucks, mm. you know, cause you're going to need a good helmet. You're going to need good boots. You're going to yes. need some, you know, some riding pants some jerseys, some gloves, helmet. I'm well, the, I already talked about helmet, but goggles yes. and all of these things. And, and, uh, and just like you mentioned, there's so many things, like it's so much to kind of take in. Yeah. If you're just going to start to play golf, it's almost, it's a little easier. Like, mm. okay, so go out and buy $300 set of clubs or something and buy some balls yep. and go out there and start golfing. And that's all you need. 
but in dirt bikes, you're like, oh, what boot should I buy? And, and what helmet should I buy? And what, what type of jersey? And what type of riding pants? And mm-hmm. this is where I've tried to just come in and give people kind of a baseline of like, hey, here's what these products are. <clears throat> because for those, of, for those of your audience that don't know, I buy, I, I can't say I bought everything full price over mm-hmm. the years because every once in a while I have taken a free thing. But mm-hmm. I would say 98%, uh, maybe even 99% of the stuff that I have ever reviewed, I pay full price for it. Mm-hmm. The companies always say, Hey, can we send this to you? And what, what I do is I look at it and I just decide, is this something that I am interested in? Mm-hmm. If it's something I'm interested in, I just buy it full price. And I use that thing for anywhere from a month to six months or even a year, mm-hmm. sometimes even two years before I talk about it. And then I say, Hey, okay. I bring it to the audience and I say, this is this thing I bought. Here's what I think is good about it. And this is my experience with it. Here's maybe a couple little things to know, like maybe this stitching came apart here a little bit, but I'm like, Hey, I still think this is a good product. Yeah. And so I'll bring these things to people. And so if you, if you see it on my channel, it's almost always like a educational thing where I'm saying, this is something that worked well for me. If it doesn't work well for me, or if I think the product sucks or really needs to be updated in some way, I almost never show that publicly. I will go back to the manufacturer if they ask for it and say, Hey, look, the reason why I'm not going to show this on my channel is because I had the problem here, here, and here. Mm -hmm. Um, Instead of ripping you a new one online, because I don't know that that really helps anybody. I'm just going to tell you, here's the reason why I'm not going to show it on my channel. And if you, if you can get this stuff figured out, come back and, you know, maybe I'll revisit it. Yeah. Yeah. But again, I'm going to buy it. And, mm-hmm. and that has given me a certain level of credibility. I mean, I'm not like the be all end all or anything mm-hmm. like that, but yeah. I've tried to become a little bit of like consumer reports, if yes. you will, yep. for the dirt bike yep. industry where it's Fair, like, hey, honest. Yeah. Yeah. If yeah. I've shown you something on the channel, it's because I really like it. Yeah. I, I don't show things that I don't like, you know, with the exception, there's been once or twice. I mean, there was one big gear company that about a year, year and a half ago, I just came onto a video and I said, Hey, you, and I don't want to mention who it is here. You can go look at my, you can go yeah. dig through my feed and find it. But mm-hmm. I was like, Hey, I bought this thing from you guys 10 years ago. Mm-hmm. And I bought this thing from you guys, you know, this thing over here, like two months ago. Mm-hmm. And I can tell you, that your quality is going downhill. Mm -hmm. And I basically scolded this company, not that they know, I don't even know if they care, but I'm just like, look, you're a big player in our industry. A ton of people are buying gear from you. And I'm looking at this and I'm going, you're not headed in the right direction. You know, so every once in a while I've, I've done that. But for the most part, I just try to show people, Hey, these are things that have really worked for me. And, and this is, this is something that, you know, maybe, maybe could work for you. Yeah. That, no, that, I think that's 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 great having that unbiased uh, feedback from somebody who is willing to say, um, you know what, I do like this or I don't like this or you know what, I'm not going to put this on my channel or or present this as content because I know it won't benefit you know the people around me. I, I don't want to. You're you're not benefiting solely off of you know off of this stuff. You actually care about giving out great feedback, which I think is is why people keep coming to you. People keep wanting to watch your videos. They trust you and you start to become like that consistent name that people want to um, continue to keep consuming content from. And it, and it, it plays a lot, especially when I know that I've got a lot of money at stake. You said it first, this sport is expensive. If I'm going out there and paying money, putting three grand into a bike and gear, I want to know that I'm going to get the direction uh, of where to put my money from a consistent a fair, honest source. And I think that's what you provide. I think that's why you're, you know, doing so great with this. And, and a lot of people are coming to it. Um, one thing that I really like that you do is that you highlight a segment of riding that I don't think gets a lot of shine. And that's, you know, weekend warriors, that's trail riding, desert riding, um, just going out there and free riding, having fun out in the woods. And not a lot of people highlight just how much fun that is in, in general. We see a lot of the racing stuff and I'm guilty of, you know, highlighting racing on, on, on our end of, uh, of, of our show and stuff like that but it, it watching it man it just it reminds me just so much of why i enjoyed riding motorcycles taking all the racing and competition aside from it riding my motorcycle and i think that's what you're tapping into how do you manage to maintain just that fun i'm here just to enjoy the sport sort of feel to your channel without getting too mired down in the competition and in all of this other stuff Man, that's a really good question. And it's a tough thing. I was just having this conversation. I was out on a ride yesterday with a, a, one of my friends from Texas. Mm-hmm. He came up here to Utah and he's kind of at a stage where 
he's kind of burning out on dirt bikes a little yeah. bit. And I think it was, and he, and we were, I was asking him questions like, well, tell me what's going on and, and what's mm-hmm. happening. And he just like through 2019 and through 2020, he just really pushed super hard. He was, mm-hmm. he was getting super competitive in this, you know, this off-road uh, racing circuit racing league that he was doing there in Texas. And mm-hmm. he was just pushing himself really, really hard. He was working really hard during the week. And then he would go on Saturdays and it was like, I had to get up at five in the morning and, and get down to, you know, this track or, or this, you know, this area or whatever, Mm. and and put in laps. And he's like, he was just pushing himself so, so hard. Mm. And, you know, Dave, you can take the fun out of just about anything. It's, it's amazing because a lot of the people that are probably watching your channel or watching my channel are, you're going, I would never burn out of dirt bikes, but Mm. I know that I could burn out of dirt bikes if I'm not careful. And the reason why I know that is because I've done that with other things in my life. Mm -hmm. You know, I feel like we need to have a certain level of, uh, what is the word? Like a moderation in just about everything that we do. I mean, you could, you look, you look like a guy who's been to the gym a couple of times. I mean, I look (laughs) at you and I go, dude, this guy is built, but (laughs) but it would be easy to wear yourself out at a gym to to get to the point where like, I, dude, I can't even come here anymore Yeah, because I'm, I'm working at it so hard. And so for me, it's been, I've known it going in, especially once I started, it was about 2015 when I realized, man, dirt bike channel, this thing that I'm doing over here mm-hmm. is starting to become a drag. Yeah. And I was only putting out like a video every week or every other week. And mm-hmm. I was like, man, this thing is starting to feel like work. Yeah. And I had to do a little bit of a mind shift change where I'm like, okay, it is work. And I'm going to start treating it like part-time work. But then the, uh, then the, uh, and then it was like, okay, I've got this thing called dirt bike channel. It's my part-time gig. It's mm-hmm. work deal with it. But then I'm like, but it's interfering with this really special thing over here, which is dirt bikes. And, and it's been a really tight balancing act, like kind of walking a tightrope of mm-hmm. where I still have fun riding dirt bikes. And, yeah. and part of that is just setting boundaries. So boundaries for me right now. Um, I try not to ride more than once a week, every once in a while during the summer, if it's like a really good riding season, I'll allow myself to do two rides a week, but one of them has to be a small, short thing. I'm Mm -hmm. talking one hour or less. Okay. The other one could be a bigger thing. Maybe we go do a trail ride for four or five hours or something. Mm -hmm. But I, so I set the boundaries there where I'm not doing too much, you know, riding. Yeah. The other thing I'll do is I set a boundary against how much dirt bike content I'm going to consume. And I've basically had to turn that dial, especially in my little genre of like trail riding or enduro riding. Mm -hmm. I've had to turn that dial down to almost zero because for two reasons, number one, I don't want to burn out. I'm making enough content. I'm like, I don't, I I can't watch somebody else's content. That's number one reason. And number two is I don't want to be biased. I don't, not biased. Everyone has their own biases. I don't want to be influenced by what someone else has to say. Yes. So if Dave, if you go out there and you rode some, you know, YZ 250F or mm-hmm. FX or something, you yeah. rode it for an hour or two, or you had it for two months. And then you put out your, your content on that. Mm-hmm. I would be influenced by that. If I watch you mm-hmm. by the time I'm watching you, I probably respect you have a little bit of trust me. And, and I would listen to what you're saying. Yeah. And then I felt that come out into my content mm-hmm. on bikes. And so I'm like, okay, one way that I can keep that from happening is I'm going to avoid content like any type of review content on bikes. I'm going to avoid that like the plague. Yeah. So that when I do come out and say what I think about a certain motorcycle or a certain fork or whatever, it's just what I have to say. It hasn't been influenced by everyone else, you know, and maybe that means, maybe that means I'm not as informed as other people, but it also might mean that I am not doing, I'm not just doing the record, like repeating the parrot speech yes. on all of these different things. And so those are some of the ways that I've kind of tried to balance it so that I don't burn out because it's, it's a real thing in our industry. I see it. I've seen it happen over and over and over. doesn't matter if you're playing football, you know, like Patrick Mahomes, he's yeah. got, he's got to like shield himself from it. And I yeah. even see the same thing with like motocross racers. Cause I'm a bit, me and in my house, we're big time motocross and supercross fans. Yeah. And I follow, I follow people's careers. My wife follows them on Instagram Mm -hmm. and you hear constantly about these writers that get burnt out. I mean, everyone from Ryan Villapoto to Ryan Dungey to Ricky Carmichael, and even, even other guys, like I I was listening to an interview just recently with Cole Mm Seeley, and he was talking about how, 
you know, towards the end of his career, he just kind of hated dirt bikes. Yeah. And if he was in, he was in Southern California and if it was a, if it was a training day mm-hmm. and it was raining, he was happy because yeah. he's like that many didn't have to go ride. Yeah. Whereas now that he's kind of, he's not riding professionally for a career. Mm-hmm. Now he's like, Hey dude, when the, when the weather is, when it rains, then I get to go ride my dirt bike with my buddies. And he's yeah. like, it's such a cool thing. And I've tried to stay in that little narrow groove where it still feels fun to get out on my dirt bike. Yeah. I think that's, that's a really good point to bring up too, because I even thought back to when I was like really, really competitive racing, like, you know, before college and stuff like that. And, you know, I, I, I in the back of my mind, I kind of had fun because I was on a motorcycle, but when you start bringing in the training, the gym, the hit this corner over and over, you're riding three, four, five times a week, you're doing Loretta's qualifiers and this, and it, it, I, by the end of it, I was like, man, I don't even like, I don't want to ride. Like I, I, I'm not having fun. It's a job. I don't want to have my dad yelling at me about going fast. You know what I mean? And, um, it wasn't until like, I took some time off for college, blah, blah, blah. But I was like, okay, I'm back to just enjoying the bike again. And that's a really good point you bring up. I can only imagine how that is like, just times 10 for any professional guy out there, like, like a Villapoto, like a Sealy. I, I mean, I know what I felt as just an amateur kid in high school, these guys must like, they must want to burn down every motorcycle they even see, you know what I mean? So um, I, I definitely get that. And I, again, it, props to you for being able to have that, um, you know, that little bit of separation, but also knowing to metering, meet, how to meter yourself to still enjoy that. Um, yeah, and, and I can definitely see the content thing being a burnout too. I mean, I'm only posting maybe once or twice a week and I'm like, whoo, this is a lot. So again, kudos to anyone out there who's doing more and, and continues to keep putting out the, the, the good stuff because it's 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 difficult, man. I, I don't think enough creators like yourself get enough credit for just how well you guys maintain that. So um, props to you. I'll, I'll, I'll give it to you. That's that's uh, that's pretty awesome. Um, so you did mention that you got, you know, you were in the cameras for a long time. You got into riding. You kind of married the two. Um, did you have an idea of how you wanted Dirt Bike Channel to um, I guess, roll out or how you wanted it to be from the early inception or did it kind of just happen? <laughs> it, Dave, it just, it just happened. And it, okay. it didn't happen overnight. Yeah. It, it was, I've, I've said it before. It's kind of like the frog in the po- boiling pot of water where mm-hmm. if you have a, if you have a pot of water boiling and you yep. put it in, you, you know, drop a frog in there, boom, it just, it jumps out immediately. Yeah. But if you put the pot in the boiling in the water when it's just warm, you know, room temperature, mm-hmm. and then you turn the stove on, the the frog will boil to death in the water. <clears throat> I mean, it's something that people do in school all the time, and that was kind of my that was kind of my experience. I I never set out to build this. I mm-hmm. just was making videos. I was making. It started off with family videos, so I would go on a camping trip or maybe Disneyland or something with my family. And I would be taking pictures and video and everything. And I'd come home and I'd make a little, you know, kind of video highlighting what we did just for the family. And then one day I took my, I took a camera, big old SLR camera, you know, a, mm-hmm. I think it was a Canon SD or 6D. If anybody knows what that is with a, you know, 24 to 105 millimeter lens. So big old lens. Yeah. And I went out there and I shot some stuff on my dirt bike while we were on a camping trip, came home, uh, put that together. It took me like 10, 12 hours to edit that yeah. down um, and put it out online. And now suddenly it, 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 it appealed to a little bit broader audience. So I'd put out these family videos and it was only my family that were watching them. So there are like 12 views. Mm-hmm. Well, I put out this one dirt bike video and it got like a hundred views. And I'm like, huh, that was interesting. So I did it another time. It takes me like 12 hours to edit another one. This one got like 400 views. Mm-hmm. And at that point, I'm like, well, what about this YouTube ad revenue thing? And I decided... I'm going to figure out how to like turn on ad revenue. I mean, I don't even know how to do this stuff. I've only done it once. So people mm-hmm. say, how do I build a YouTube channel? And honestly, my best, my best advice to people is make sure you have a good job, you know, yeah. because it's YouTube isn't going to pay for yourself, pay for your bill, pay your bills in the beginning. Yeah. But over time, I just set small goals. So the first one was the first goal that I remember creating having was what if I, what if I, uh, made a goal to make enough money, like Mm -hmm. just $10,000 on YouTube ad revenue. And I remember thinking at the time, you know, this probably isn't going to be that hard. And, and when I get that $10,000, I'm going to buy this motorcycle and I'm probably going to feel guilty. Yeah. And, and I was even envisioning, like imagining what I would say to people. I'd be like, Hey, thanks for, thanks for watching these videos because, and I feel bad that you guys paid for this dirt bike. By the time I had made $10,000 in YouTube ad revenue, I don't even know how many years went by. It was like, 
two and a half, three years. Yeah. And that was the hardest money I've ever made in my whole life. Mm. I mean, it's just hard. It yeah. isn't money. To, it isn't easy to make money. You see people like, I mean, like channels like dude, perfect or mm-hmm. whoever else. And they're getting yeah. 88 million views on a single video. I've yeah. never had more than a million views. I, in yeah. fact, the, the biggest video views I've ever had is a private video that I, mm-hmm. I, we can, that's a whole other story, but yeah. So the whole thing just happened slowly. And, yeah. and finally, after years and years and years of doing this and working full time mm-hmm. and just coming home and putting three, four, five, six, seven, eight hours a day into yep. this side project. Yep. Finally, it got to this point where I had said to multiple people, I'd said it to my wife, mm-hmm. I'd said it to other coworkers that I was with. I was like, Hey, if dirt bike channel ever gets to X amount and yep. I'm going to keep that amount private, yeah. but if it gets to X amount revenue, mm-hmm. gross revenue, while I'm working this part-time, I'd be a fool not to jump into it full-time. Yeah. And I remember I'm sitting there. It's the summer of 2018. So three years ago, mm-hmm. I'm sitting at my, my prior company yeah. and I'm sitting there and I'm, you know, I'm doing technology sales at the time yeah. and I pull up a spreadsheet and I start entering some data mm-hmm. and I just sat back in my chair, completely terrified because I'm going, okay, this is going to do. In fact, it's already pretty much within mm-hmm. just a few percentage points. It's already done what I said it would have to do yep. in a year to jump into it full time. And now Dave, the question is, what do I do? Yeah. I've got health insurance at this company. I've got, you know, uh, benefits. Uh, there's, there's like a, you know, a package that is here keep trying to keep me here. Like kind of like a carrot dangling package, yeah. like a stock options type stuff. Yep. And I'm going, Oh my gosh, what do I do? Mm-hmm. And I, I talked about it with my wife and I thought, I thought about it for a month and a half and I'm like, I'm going to quit my job and I'm going to go into this dirt bike channel thing. And it was terrifying. Mm -hmm. Um, and it, it has consistently been rewarding, Mm -hmm. terrifying. It's been the most stress I've ever had. It's been the most work I've ever done. Um, but it's also been really, really nice to, to just know that, you know, me and my wife are doing this. No one else is helping us. We're, we're making this work and we're building, hopefully, hopefully I'm building something that I can be proud of. And at the very least, it's kind of a kind of cataloging and documenting my life in a way that the other jobs that I've had in the past really didn't do. Yeah. So I didn't set out to make this. I didn't set out to build this. It just sort of happened organically. And I've just kind of been rolling with it and trying to figure out how to build it and, and continue to grow it and make it something that at least I can be proud of, you know? No, that, that is, that's freaking awesome. I'm glad you talked about that because not many people do. We always talk about, yeah, I want to be, you know, on my own with my own company or my own YouTube channel or my own, whatever my own venture is, but they don't talk about making that transition from, like you said, the dangling carrot, working for a company. And then when you transition over to your own deal, how terrifying, exciting, rewarding, um, stressful, gut punching up and down it can be, you know, I think you touched on a really, really good point. Um, just about how, you know, scary, this just point blank, scary that leap is. And when you're able to do that, and I think it's freaking cool that you were able to really set those high goals and really put the work in and see it come to fruition. Cause I, I'll tell you firsthand, uh, having fallen short of a lot of goals, it is God dang difficult, man. So, um, I think, I think that's awesome. And you bring, bring up another point about doing it with your wife. And one thing that I really wanted to highlight was, um, you know, you, you do these amazing bike giveaways, which we'll talk about in a second. And when I saw the drawing for it, it was your wife, it was your kids. It was such a family ordeal. And even I brought my girlfriend in to watch it. Cause you know, we, we buy stuff to, from a dirtbike channel.com. Uh, we've got a bunch of pairs of socks and stickers and masks and stuff like that. Um, so if you ever see me at the track, you'll know why I'm wearing the the, the socks. <laughs> um, so yeah, she was watching with me and she was like, oh, it's just this cool. Did this family just win? I'm like, no, that's the family that's giving away stuff. And she, we, honestly, I had never really seen a family affair. It's usually a company doing a giveaway or one singular guy. But the fact that we saw your kids and your wife there, I think that's so rare and so awesome to see that, you know, you're really making it a family ordeal, which makes people want to trust you even more, makes you seem even, you know, 
more authentic, which you, which you are, you know, and, and, and the fact you want to share it with your family and, and, and have something where your kids are represented. I think that's so cool. Cause I mean, there's, there's kids out there that can be like, Oh, cool. I, this guy's got kids that are around my age. I trust what he says about minis or eighties or whatever it is, you know? So um, I think it's just so multifaceted and such a benefit to be able to showcase that. Um, so kudos again, kudos to you. It's, it's really remarkable to see that stuff. Yeah, it's been it's it's a lot of fun getting the kids involved. Um, and and my wife is a big part of the reason why this works. Yeah, you know the reason why I'm able to even have this interview with you is mm-hmm. because she's making sure that the kids are not pounding. You know, in the kitchen, in the kitchen upstairs. <laughs> yeah, she's like, I, I just tell her, like, hey, I'm recording. She's like, okay, well, we'll keep the kids out of the kitchen because I'm yeah. right below the kitchen in this okay, little okay, base, okay. in this little basement um, office, and yeah. I'm in the smallest room in the house. And I, mm. I'm this room is only like eight feet wide by nine feet wide, mm. and this is just kind of my dungeon where I live. And yeah, um, it's been, I think, I, I don't know how it looks to my kids. I, I. I feel like, you know, I was working jobs away from home, obviously mm-hmm. for my whole career, but now the last three years, they see me at home. And even my, my youngest, my four-year-old daughter, mm-hmm. I tell my, I tell her that I need to go to work and, and I just go downstairs. She has no recollection of me going off to an office outside of the house. And yeah. I wonder how that's going to be down the road. I try to set expectations to my kids. I'm like, you're mm-hmm. probably not going to be able to do what I do. Yeah. You know, mm-hmm. it, like every the job that you're going to have there's a high probability it doesn't even exist yet. Like we haven't yeah. thought of it yeah. because yeah. you're going to enter the workforce in 15, 20 years or whatever. I'm like 20 years ago, no one was sitting there in their, you know, riding dirt bikes and reviewing them for a living. Just, yeah. you know, there were guys that did that, but I mean, they were, they were, you worked for Yamaha or whatever, and you were yeah. a test rider with Yamaha yeah. and you got that job because you were like a racer. And then, you know, you kind of retire from racing and you, you moved into that. But mm-hmm. I'm doing this thing that I don't have any credentials for it. Yeah, the only yeah. credentials I have are I just started putting out videos and I started and people started to relate to it and they started to say, oh, well, he knows a little bit more about dirt bikes than I do because I'm just getting into it. Mm-hmm. And so it just kind of builds over time. And I'm going to my kids, you probably won't be able to do this unless we can build the dirt bike channel into some larger enterprise, which mm-hmm. is still possible. And hopefully that's the, I mean, that's the goal. Um, but I don't think you're just going to be able to start a YouTube channel in 12 years from now on something that you're passionate about and pay the bills. Maybe, but I try to tell them like, we've got to look for opportunities for you guys. You know, we've got to look, I was telling my sons and my daughter or my oldest, the oldest three kids. I'm like, we've got to spend the next decade Mm -hmm. really paying attention to what's happening in the world Mm -hmm. and looking for opportunities for you to make money. Like right now, everyone is becoming a a computer programmer. I'm like, 10 years from now, you know, what we need to do is see where the holes are in this. Maybe, maybe we need you guys to become plumbers. Maybe Mm -hmm. if you guys were electricians, you would murder it, you know, because everyone wants to go into like these other industries and it kind of leaves a vacuum in this other place, you know? And so that's another cool thing. Like what you're doing with the, with the collective experience, you're trying to give people exposure into a, like a certain area that they're interested in, but they don't have a, they don't really have a foot in the door, Exactly. you know? And, and I, I so I love what you're doing. I want to learn more about it. I want to come do some of your, your, uh, your internships and things, because yeah. I think that we need to, let me, let me just be frank. Mm-hmm. Everyone who rides a dirt bike probably wants to become Eli Tomac or, or, uh, you know, Ken Roxon, but not a lot of us aren't going to be that guy. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And, you know, you worked your butt off in racing and you know, you didn't become Ken Roxon. You didn't be far from it. <laughs> you didn't become Cooper Webb, but, yeah, yeah. The, but the industry mm. needs other people in it. They need all these other people yeah. to support the Cooper webs and to support the Ken Roxons. Yeah. And, and those are, those are, those are good jobs, yeah. you know, especially if you have an interest in motorsport. And exactly. that's one of the cool things that I, I like about what you're doing. And um, I think it's genius is you're kind of helping people to get a foot in the door, at least to get a little taste of it, you know, to what it might be to be in this industry. And maybe some of those people are going to be like, oh, this isn't for me. And others are going to be like, yeah, I totally want to do this. And 